Hey everyone, I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone. On today's episode, I talk with Lucille Aaron Wayne, a longtime certified IFS therapist, Jungian analyst in training, and art therapist. She helps people who feel and think deeply learn how to do IFS on themselves and claim it as their own personal self healing tool. We talk about the importance of doing IFS on our own, the different skill sets needed to do solo IFS, and six common self-like parts. I love how practical this episode is, and I also love how Lucille talks about the importance of doing our own work and building a bridge between our regular life and our self-energy, which I think we all want to do more of. You can connect with Lucille at seekdeeply.com and get a free one-hour guide to solo IFS. If you're listening in real time, this is the last episode for 2022. In 2023, our first episode is going to be with our favorite guest who is making his third appearance on the podcast. I so appreciate him and his support. Next year is going to be dedicated to a book project that involves over 30 different authors in the IFS community. So we are going to start off talking about the vision for the book, the vision for the future of IFS, and invite everyone to talk about or think about their own personal visions for the new year. Thanks always for your support and encouragement. I so appreciate it. It has been quite an interesting year. Another little nugget that Lucille says that I absolutely loved is that we don't need to do what a part of us asks us to do. We need to be authentic. That's our job, not to be in self or do IFS right, but to show up for our parts and be authentic. Enjoy. So I'm super excited to talk to you today. I know that that I, I just said this to you, but people ask me this question all the time. So I'm really excited that we're talking about this. I think it's going to be really helpful. But before we jump in, why don't you tell everybody where you are in the world and what you see when you look out your nearest window? Well, thank you so much for having me, Pammy. I am in the Netherlands, which is in Western Europe, and we are about a quarter of a day ahead of the U.S., so it is dark right now, but I know there are my neighbor's yards, and there are these tiny little yards and these tiny little houses, and it's so cute. What brought you to the Netherlands? My husband got a job here. How long have you guys been there? Uh, We have been here four years. We moved when, uh, right before, when we had a little infant. And it's an amazing country. If I could design a country, it would be basically the Netherlands. There's biking and there's art and there's beautiful flowers. And yeah, it's a, there's a social welfare state. So I love it. Good, good. I'm glad that you love it. Um, I'm like, I could just keep talking about this, but I guess we probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, um, so we talked a little bit about, um, how to do solo, how to do solo IFS. Um, And I think no matter who you are, if you're a listener and you're a therapist, practitioner, coach, client, whoever you are listening to this, we all want to and need to do our own work. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is I wanted IFS to be accessible to everyone, whether they had access to therapy or could afford therapy or not. And so, um, and this is becoming more and more prevalent because people can't get into therapy, even if they were able to, you know, had access to it. So, um, so tell me about, um, maybe let's just start with why this subject is important to you and why it feels, uh, why you feel passionate about, about, you know, helping people do their own IFS work by themselves? Mm. Well, all of my work is about helping people find their own inner authority. 
and I call it your inner compass or your soul compass. So, you know, like most therapists, that is born of my own journey. Um, for much of my life, I had my authority outside of me. First, of course, it was my family, my parents, um, institutions. Even when I first trained in IFS, I was trying to be the good student and get that validation. So there's so many reasons it's important to be able to do IFS on our own. One of them is that there's an implicit promise in IFS. And that's one of the things that makes it so special and calls so many of us into it. It's so empowering that we can meet our parts and we can relate to our parts. And I know from experience that the skill set to do IFS on ourselves is a different skill set than what's taught in the IFS trainings. It's different than what we hear in podcasts or on demos. Yeah, so before I learned this skill set, I, of course, tried to do IFS on my own. And I even went through the level one training more than 10 years ago. And in between the training sessions, because they were spread out over a year, I would sit down with my journal, I'd go inside, and I would meet a part maybe, but then it would stop, it would get blocked. And I started to get a sneaking suspicion that something was wrong with me because I knew the skills, how to do IFS. And by the time I completed and got that certificate, I had proven that I knew the skills, but I couldn't be in self with myself. And that really undermined my self-trust. And by self-trust, I mean just in my whole person. And it planted a seed that I think was very, yeah, I'll just say it was undermining. Um, so I actually had to take a break from doing IFS on myself. I went eight years without doing it. And I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. Um, my inner compass basically wound up telling me that I was harming myself by trying to pound the IFS process out. And, you know, counterintuitively, it was right for me to stop doing it because I wasn't doing it in a healthy way. Mm. Now I've gone on lots of different healing paths. I'm a Jungian and I get to bring that in. I'm an art therapist. And I've been able to come back to IFS for myself with a whole new skill set and a deep inner compass. And I do have the skills now but I don't see them being taught anywhere else. So I'm passionate about making them accessible to others so that other people don't have to take an eight-year break from IFS. I love that. I love that. Okay. So tell me about, of course, I have a hundred thousand questions, but um, I'm like, part of me is like, let's stay somewhat on topic. Tell me about what is the different skill set that people need to begin to do their own work on themselves? So there are two big pieces that are important to start with. And the first is mindset. So the idea of doing IFS on ourselves can give us the impression that we're going to recreate what we had in our therapy session or what we've read about. The mindset piece is to recognize that solo IFS is going to sound and look and unfold differently than the classic IFS script. And it should because it is a different process. So the first piece is to let ourselves off the hook of trying to be the perfect IFS client and therapist at the same time and get that accurate mindset. Okay, this is gonna be a unique process and it's unique for each person. There's no one pathway. The only right way to do IFS on ourselves is our own way. So that's mindset number one. And number two is containment. So, you know, this is a huge word in therapy for therapists. Um, for those who don't know, containment is what a therapist does 
when you have your session, even just starting with there's an appointment in the calendar, there's a time and a place or you know, you bring your computer to a particular place and open it up. There's that ritual and there's a duration that you're going to be talking with your therapist. You know, it's not going to go on forever. The therapist's job of many is to watch the clock, is to pay attention to what's coming up, where maybe an exile is, where the healing seems to need to go and to help guide you there. And to Keep in mind the IFS process and the pathway. But when we do solo IFS, we don't have our therapist there, yet we still need containment. So if we're not thinking about this ahead of time, typically, and this is personal experience, what we'll do is we will try to be our own therapist. And that sets us up for splitting. Because then we have, we invite in a managerial attitude and then we're trying to be authentic and be with our parts. We've already split from the wholeness and there's already kind of a layer of falsity there. But fortunately, there are amazing technologies, ancient technologies we can use to set us up or containment. And what I teach people to do is create a ritual. You know, IFS is a shamanic tool. And that's one of the reasons it's so powerful and groundbreaking in our society. We don't have access to these tools, most of us. And that means as a shamanic tool that we get to draw on these practices that our ancestors have been doing for millennia, their technologies. So it's very simple to create a ritual. We set the intention, we're gonna do a ritual before we go into our inner system. And then we'll do one at the end. That's the containment. We, we set a time and I can explain what is involved. Yeah, okay. So a ritual can involve a few different modalities. Typically it's going to involve intention. So we invite in that which is greater than us to hold the space for us. And what that does is it, it brings in our own humility. It brings in the power of that which is greater. And it frees us to just be present with our parts. So we can set this intention through language. I like to talk about the old steps. So they're old because they're ancient and they're old because it's O, oh shoot, O-L-D. So the first is O, object. We're in a particular place. You take a ritual object and we can talk about what that is. You place it somewhere with meaning so you can see it. And then you go to L, O-L-D, language. You state your intention for the time. It could be something spontaneous like, May I connect with what's inside? It could be a prayer, if you're religious or a standard line you always say. And then the dance. So we invite our bodies to ground and to participate in this inner journey. Because again, otherwise, if we ignore the body, we are discouraging wholeness. We're making it hard for our, our whole selves to be here. So. Dance is moving in some intentional way to mark the space. It could be drawing a circle with your arms. It could be putting your forehead to the ground and focusing, rounding, seeing what it feels like. And once we've done those three steps, we are in the space of non-ordinary reality. And that's where we meet our parts. And then after we have our time, we go back out and we do the steps if you want to follow the old steps, you can do them in reverse or frontwards. And then you come back to our shared, regular, ordinary world. Beautiful. I love that so much. I mean, as you're talking, I'm actually feeling even more kind of self-energy as you're talking. And I was thinking, wow, to set to set myself up that way before I go inside. Well, actually, the old, those steps actually are a way of of being inside. I could kind of feel that. It's sort of, it's like, it's like you're doing that before you go inside. It's, 
it's um it's almost like kind of doing that also I don't know I don't know it's, it's that's the what passageway it's feeling. oh it's beautiful yeah yes I love that I love that so then are there any skills then once people do do that ritual then is there anything you would say is different about um finding a part or or trying to get to know a part um yeah. when they get to that section yeah <laughs> that section that part of the protocol yeah that, that phase yeah phase so, i like that word that's good yeah so there are of course, the countless ways we can start. Um, I should have mentioned that we want to have a journal with us and a pen, if that's the modality that we're using. I, I do recommend that as a starting modality. Um, there are other ways we can do solo IFS. Uh, so to start, we have our materials. And I like to teach something called hash mark writing. So it's basically a dialogue that you write down. And you make just a little dash uh, for what you're thinking. So it could be, is the part that is worried about the holidays here? And then you wait for a response. And when something comes up, you do another dash and then you write what, what comes. And then when you respond, you do a dash. And the reason this is important is that we don't label who is speaking for two reasons. One. We may think we know who the part is, but we might be wrong. And two, we may think that we're in self, but we may be blended with a part. So if we're labeling self when we're talking, then there can be a lot of confusion inside if there's actually a part blended with us. So we don't need to worry about the labels. It's the connection and the relationship and the dialogue that matters. And that's how, that's the mechanics of the writing. But to actually start, I talk about three runways. So always, if there's something that you want to dive into and you know that, you just go for it. Start the hash mark writing. But if you want a prompt, um, there are different runways we can use to take off with our plane. So one runway is to think about something that happened in the last week that troubled us or seemed unusually upsetting, something we want to look into more. And then you ask a question about that, such as, hey, what was going on here when I got so upset about the cousin? Another runway, the second runway is to simply describe what's happening right now. It could be, I feel a presence in my stomach and it's tingly. And to just continue describing that until a question naturally arises. And the third runway is to simply ask who here now, who wants attention? So it's really just creating that open invitation for our parts to arise and so much of the time, there is someone or someone's who do very much want our attention. Yeah, um, that's so beautiful. I love that. I love how um, you're really giving people a gift with this because you're giving them this beautiful ritual that sets them up and kind of connects them to their own bodies and their own self energy, and then giving them something really specific, so it, which helps flooding, because I think that I have clients and even myself, sometimes it's sort of like there's so much happening and so much happening in my head or in my body that it's hard to connect with. It's hard to unblend. And so the three run, the three runways give, um, well, I just had this thought sort of, it helps unblend. It helps unblend. It gives direction, but I'm also feeling like it builds trust which I think mm. is one of the things that you um, you are saying for you that kept you from doing it. And I, for something about setting yourself up that way, like the structure that feels like, feels very trusting to my system. Mm. I wonder, do you think it's about the leadership? Yeah, because it's, because it, well, what just came up for me is like, you don't know what you're doing, right? Like, so if you, you know, so I have clients and even myself, if I'm like, um, 
yeah, if I'm like, I'm so flooded, I have so much going on and da, 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 da. And if there is this sort of sense of like, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I think my clients feel that way, right? Like I want to work with a part, but I don't know what I'm doing. And so if I have the part that says, you don't know what you're doing, um, and then I'm really blended with the, you don't know what you're doing part, then, um, then there is, yeah. And, and then when that part I think is really strong, I think it's really hard for people then to, um, to have leadership, to have that self-leadership to say, okay, mm. yes, this, that's just a part actually that just said mm-hmm. that. Um, so yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I even feel that nervousness of that part. I think my heart started beating faster when you were naming that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. And also, if that's what we're feeling at the start, of course, we can try the runways, but we could also write that down. You don't know what you're doing and then respond. You know, the power of writing down instead of trying to do IFS in our heads or simply spoken is it creates, a, again, a container. And there's something about the process of putting into the tangible world what's in psyche that is all chemical. And even if we don't, especially if we don't try to change anything, simply writing what's going on shifts it. And then we can relate to it. It's right there. There are the letters, the black pen. Right. I love that. I love that. So if I'm just feeling the anxiety of, you know, you don't know what you're doing, right? You don't know what you're doing. If I'm just feeling that something does definitely, and I love journaling. So I'm totally getting this, that like writing the dash and then writing, you don't know what you're doing. I I'm immediately calmer and I'm immediately aware that now I can relate to that part of me instead of being that part of me, I can now relate to it. It's different. There is me. And then there's the part of me. Um, and so by writing it down, there is the relation uh, by relating to it. And then you're doing, which I'm putting in quotes, you're doing IFS right there, but you're, you're doing it. Um, I think some people write, like if my eyes aren't shut, if I'm not inside, then I'm not doing IFS, but you're doing it by just relating to that sentence differently. Yes. And there can be something about having the eyes open. And looking at the page, of course, that's also involving more of our senses in our body. And it's also kind of training wheels for when we're in regular life and it feels right to be aware of our parts. So if the eyes are open, we have this dual focus and yeah. <laughs> I love that, right? Because I've, I, yeah. Right. Let's see if you're thinking of holidays, which is when this uh, will be released. Right. So you can't just be at your cousin's house, your grandmother's house or whatever, and a part's up and you're like, wait, I need to shut my eyes. I need to go inside. I need to unblend. Like, <laughs> no, nope, that's not going to happen. Like you're going to have to be aware of the parts that are coming up, like while your eyes are open and you're at your family's house. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So I love it. So it's training wheels. Let's just, I love that. It's cute. Yeah, it is. And, you know, there is something else that's different about solo IFS that I really want to name. It's a kind of a superpower of solo IFS and it's going to sound topsy-turvy radical. I know that. Um, When we're doing solo IFS, we do not have to try to be in self. And in fact, if we try, we're going to undo being in self because that invites in a self-like part. So a part that has some of those C qualities, compassion, curiosity, connection, calm that self has, but it's a part that has its own agenda. It can resemble self. We, it sort of sounds like what self might say. That's a self-like part. And boy, that part is going to jump right up if we try to be in self. So fortunately, if we've set up that ritual containment, we were already bringing in that self energy. It's imbued in our space and we can just show up as exactly who we are. So if it's you, Tammy, it's the regular Tammy, you know, feeling what you're feeling. Maybe it's a little bit of annoyance with something that happened before you sat down. Maybe it's um, excitement about something that's coming up later. You just get to be there. You don't have to try to unblend at all. 
And so I think it's useful in order to spot these self-like parts to be aware of what the most common ones are. And I could talk about that if you want. There are six. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that would be that would be great. And I I love that because there is this there is this message, right, that you know, I I need to be in self and and I want to do solo IFS so there's so there is more self available. And so yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Okay, yeah. So, you know, another advantage of solo IFS is that when we do get that self energy more and more in us as we're relating to parts yet we're not trying to be in self or we're, if we're a therapist, we're not in therapist mode or we're not, you know, in client mode. We're already building a bridge between the experience of self in classic IFS and regular life because we're blending a little bit self energy and to use you as an example, the regular Tammy. So yes, the six most common self-like parts. I can just name them. Yeah, okay. So the first one is the helper, the rescuer, the parent, the fixer. And this is the part that if we saw, if we experienced something very wounded inside, maybe we even had an image of a child that was in a dark place with its head down. If we had the impulse to take that child out there right away or to bring the child something warm if it looked cold, it's a really powerful, wonderful instinct. And I have that impulse myself sometimes when I'm with a client and there's a part in exile there. And that is very likely a self-like part, a helper. One of the ways we know that is that it's wanting to take action before connecting with the part. I love so, that, right? It wants yeah. to take action before connecting. Yeah. I mean, that we do that in our relationships, like in our external relationships. So that's fantastic. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. When self-energy comes in, in regular life, I notice for myself, everything slows down and I'm in that moment. I'm not thinking about fixing it with, yeah. with the person I care about. Yeah. That's beautiful. So the second self-like part is and I think that your listeners will relate to this, the IFS enthusiast. So this is the part that has learned the sequence of IFS, is gung-ho about it. And again, I'm raising my hand here because this was me very much, and sometimes still is, and knows about the process of unburdening. So let's use the same example of finding an exile in a dark place. If we have the impulse of, all right, I want to unburden that exile and retrieve it and so on. Uh, that is another sign that it's a self-like part, that it's an IFS enthusiast who's focused on the end result rather than, again, being with the part. And the reason all of this matters is if we do healing from a self-like part, it's not going to be as deep and it's not going to be lasting. So that can be a little bit risky because again, if we don't realize that's what's happened, it may undermine our faith in IFS or in ourselves or in our self energy. Beautiful. And I'm also thinking if that, if we start with that, like if we start with writing and the dashes, we start with writing the dashes, but we have that, if we're doing it from that part, then other parts may not, might not be as open or communicative um, because they know, oh, you're just trying to get to the exile. Oh, you're just trying to get to an unburdening um, or you're just trying to be in self. <laughs> so um, yeah, I can see that it's disrupting the whole process. So then you're like, so then we lose the trust in being able to do solo IFS when, when we start off with doing it from a self-like part. Yes. Yes, Tammy, that's right. And you just named something that's a big touchstone for solo IFS, which is if we are journaling, if we're doing the hash mark writing and nothing's coming, that can be a big sign. Okay, maybe there's a self-like part that I'm blended with right now. And it's kind of obvious because you can see on the page, it's not getting filled. Um, there's just a big pause. And this is what I experienced, as I mentioned years ago when I would get stuck and then it, you know, would bring in the frustration and so on. So that's something that we can always check if we feel blocked. Oh, am I blended with a self-like part right now? Who's here? Yeah. 
Yeah. I love that because you do the three run three runways right there, right? Like sort of you're asking, then you're noticing your body because we can notice the shutdown. We can notice the numb. We can notice the blank. And then the who's here. Yeah. That's right. The observation, the grounding, being present, and then the open invitation to connect. Exactly. That's right. Beautiful. Yeah. So the third self-light part is similar to the one before. It's the good student. And this is, let's say we see that exile and we're going through the protocol. So we're thinking, all right, am I feeling the C qualities? Which one am I feeling? Do I feel curious? You know, we're checking. And this is a sign if we have this response that's very positive because it means that we are internalizing the IFS process. And it may even be an unavoidable stage in learning how to do IFS. And... That is a part if we are striving to do it right, quote unquote. So when we notice that, we can we can check, okay, what are you afraid would happen if you made space for me to handle this process? Beautiful. I love that. Um, I, and I think that definitely could get... Um, can be the other thing where it's sort of like it doesn't look or feel like it does in therapy or it's not going fast enough or sort of so so that beginning expectation that is going to look different like that might help some of those parts kind of just like the way we do protocol doing some of this upfront work <laughs> you're doing upfront work can actually really help us as we get you know, kind of go inside and get closer to our parts mm, yes yes so it, it's great because Solo IFS ideally is very intuitive and it requires setting up some structures ahead of time. So if we do that education with ourselves and do that little bit of work of getting the ritual object and saying something and the dance, then we are, we have so much freedom. Love it. Love it. Okay. Are you ready for the fourth part? Okay. That is the the therapist part. So I'm totally have been here, am here still sometimes. It's when we see the exile and we, maybe we know a little bit about why it might be there. Um, And we might say, oh, it's not your fault. It's so understandable. Of course you blamed yourself. That's natural for a child to do. It was your survival strategy. And we use that, you know, the psychoeducation, um, the knowledge that we have to, it really is another form of fixing, of helping. Um, and again, it's it's not listening to the part as self would do and finding out what's it like just being with the part? What's it like to be that part? Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. It's actually reminding me of, I was doing a, a friend of mine, we do practice sessions back and forth and that's exactly what happened. There was sort of like, I was doing direct access with her, with her exile. And I began doing that, doing sort of a more analyzing, more like, well, here's why you did what you did. And da, 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 da. and she, and, and she had to kind of come out of it and was like, that felt terrible. And so, um, <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, and thankfully we have a good relationship, but um, yeah, I was like, wow, how often do I do that? Right. That I, I shift into some sort of like therapist analyzing kind of heady part instead of just really being there and connected and just saying, what would this, what was this like for you? Yeah. Mm. So that's great. Yeah. That was a and- super huge learning, learning opportunity for me. I bet. And I love how open you can be with yourself and seeing that so clearly. Yeah. Well, thankfully, yeah, it was, I think because, because it, 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 because it did harm, but it did harm to her Mm. exile. And so then Mm -hmm. we were able to talk about it and I was able to repair and, um, and, you know, as a therapist to do harm (laughs) Mm. is awful. So, um, yeah. So it was, but, but it was a really good, I, I feel like I learned a lot from that. So, so yeah, I think that's a great, so there's a part of me, you know, there's definitely a part that I can get to know a little bit better that, that does that sometimes to myself and to my clients probably. Yeah. Yeah. And with all of these self-like parts, the response is really the same, which is what are you afraid would happen if you weren't doing this job? 
if you let me connect with the exile or the one that needs attention. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you said that you, you learned it so deeply because of course, when we experience any process, it's internalized. And so as we practice solo IFS and forge our own course, our own route through our psyche, we internalize each of the lessons that we need to learn. And that's, there's a kind of a paradox here because there's some things that can be taught. And we've talked about some of those like ritual containment, the three runways, stuff like parts. And it is such a different process to do IFS on ourselves because we discover what is the next right thing to do. There's not a roadmap. And that also increases our self-trust each time we do it. And just as for you, it, it went very deep, that lesson. Similarly, when we listen to that feeling inside that says, oh, go here, this feels right. We are going, that's burning even deeper in our neural pathways, into our soul. And so it does increase self-trust outside of the session. I love that. I love that from what you said at the beginning is that, you know, we have our own inner compass, our own, you know, our own authentic self. And, but we're told and taught that actually, and this is a global statement, so this might not fit for everybody, but sort of that other people, I'll say, oh, I'll say it for myself, right? Like I was taught that other people know better, right? Other people tell me how I feel, what I think. Um, and so it's sort of like, I could have an inner, like, ooh, this doesn't feel good, but someone else will say, well, like, no, it does. And you're just being too sensitive or, or whatever. Um, and so we really do learn um, to not trust our inner, our inner, to not listen, um, to ignore, to not trust um, our inner compass. And so that's so beautiful because then if we're, what you're saying is then if part of solo IFS is I'm learning to trust here's where we go and here's where here's where I go with this and then um yeah gosh I can't imagine like the impact that has on us just just that that I can trust myself and I can trust that voice or that like here's here's the here's the next right decision for me and I know that and then there's a you know what does it feel like to know this is the the right next decision for me it's life changing to yeah. choose solo IFS. Yes, number five is the wise part. And five and six are kind of similar. They're both about basically some spiritual bypassing. So the wise part is if we see the exile and then we go to, it's really okay because in the grand scheme of things, love is all that matters or we're all one or something like that where it's, you know, it's not so bad, silver lining. That is a self-like part. And the wise part and number six, which is the mystic part, can be really tricky to catch because they do sound very wise. And they, I think especially for Westerners, they are, there's a, there's a connection to a different way of thinking that makes them feel extra powerful. Uh, they make them feel like it's not something we would think up ourselves that our ego would come up with. And yet those still can be self-like parts. So the mystic part would be, we see the exile and then we magically give it sparkles and change the environment. And we make all these incredible things happen. And I'm going to say this, I think it is the trickiest to catch if you don't know what it is. But once you know, you're empowered. You can notice the mystic part if these incredible changes are happening in the inner world, one after the other, and there's not a connection with the, the wounded part. So it's, again, the change happening before, you, you know, is that what the part wanted? Did the part ask for that? Or is it kind of almost like a magic trick and illusion, smoke and mirrors that's happening? 
Yeah, I love that. And that is a slight difference, right? Like, so instead of asking, let's say like if you're at the XL and asking the XL, like what it needs or how does it want to release the burden or whatever, you're just like, oh, here's like, right, I want to give it this or do this. And, um, and it can be slight, but I think, I think the more you do solo IFS, you're going to feel the difference or you're going to know the difference. Um, by, you know, what does the part need and what feels like a connecting energy. Um, and you're right, like it could feel so like um, amazing being like, oh, this magical experience happened and it was so spiritual and that's great, but is that what the part needed? And, and I think those feel, I can experience that very differently. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's something that we can ask before we close our session is I like to always make some time for the closing phase. And so to let the parts know, and again, this is the connection. So it brings us back to that touchstone. Maybe we were blended with the self-like part, but then it's our closing phase. We, we turn towards the part and we let it know soon, I'm gonna come out of this space that you're in. And is there anything you wanna request between now and the next time that I come back to you? Ideally, we might even know how long that'll be, like in a week or next month. And then we listen to what the part requests. The point is not to do what the part asks, but to be authentic. And that's our job when we go inside, not to be in self, not to do IFS right, but to show up and to be authentic. So let's say the part says, I want you to check in with me every day. It sounds so wonderful, but from my experience, that is actually a big ask. Um, some people are able to do it, but very often that may be unrealistic. Um, the part might be asking, I want you to never speak with so-and-so again, and you have to because they're at work. Uh, so I'm giving examples of things the part might ask that aren't doable. And if that's what happens, then we say, we, we see what our natural spontaneous response is and we're honest. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. I think that might be too much. And then we see how the part feels. It, it's, it's a real relationship. And I so, love that so much instead of being like, okay, yes, you know, cause I have this tendency to be like, yes, I'm going to check in with you every day and da, 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 da. Um, and so I love that, that, that just because the part asks for something doesn't mean that that we have to agree to do that. It, and because that also doesn't feel authentic. It feels like another part of me. That's like my manager, like, yes, I'll check in with you every day and I'll go for a run and I will only eat kale. And did it, like, it has that kind of same, like <laughs> totally. same energy to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Is there anything else you would say about closing? Um, and I also have a question about, do you, do you set up ahead of time, like, we're going to do this for 30 minutes and I'm going to set a timer. Like, is there a time, is there a time container you do? And is there anything else you do for closing? Great question. I do recommend a time container uh, and something that it could be a playlist that you have that lasts a certain amount of time. Of course, you can set an alarm. Um, in terms of closing, I also like to invite the part to consider if it wants a, like a hotline to reach me, a red phone kind of thing. So it's asking the part, if you want to communicate with me and I'm not already paying attention, is there some way you wanna grab my attention? It could be a physiological sign, like a chill. It could be giving me an image in my head that we agree upon right now. So I know what that is or hearing a certain song in my head. And if the part decides it does want that, then we know in regular life, okay, when that happens, oh, that's my part. And I'm going to turn towards it. doesn't mean I'm going to do an IFS session right then necessarily, but I will turn towards it and acknowledge it. So there's that connection, that bridge again, between the session, which is so powerful and regular life. And that is us weaving together self energy into just being who we are. I love it. Regular life. Um, you're using your hands. And one that reminded me of um, something that I stole from someone long ago that, that we could say, um, okay, I'm just going to put my hand right on my heart. 
right? Like, so if I'm out and about and I'm doing regular life and, and I notice you're, you know, this, you're blended or you, you need something from me, I'm just going to put my hand right here. Or um, I had a client um, just today that was uh, like the part ended up on her shoulder. And so I was like, okay, so as you go, your life is crazy busy as all, all of our lives are. So when you notice that, just put your hand on your shoulder. So you could do that like as you're driving your kids, right? Or as you're baking dinner, we're just going to, just going to put your hand on your shoulder, sort of really, um, you know, use use our bodies that way, right? That, uh, yep, I'm right here. I can, I can feel you. I'm right here. Oh, I love that. And yeah, we can agree upon what we're going to do. And that creates a safety that again, builds the self-trust. All right, before we end, our, we're coming to the end, unfortunately. So is there any, any other last minute things or sort of last suggestions you would want to say or thoughts you have? Yes, I want to encourage anyone who wants to do IFS on their own to claim it as their own. You know, this inner compass that we have and this process of solo IFS, what it does is it decenters the model from being our authority, which we can accidentally center as having the answers. We are free to do exactly what's right for our unique soul when we do solo IFS. We are our inner authority. I love that, right? So IFS, IFS is is not, and the IFS Institute and Dick, even though we love him, or I do, <laughs> those are not the authority, right? That is not the authority. Yeah, beautiful. I love That's that right. so much. Right, respect, not reverence. I love that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And we we get, uh, I think we get accused of of um, having less of reverence and being a cult, um, which I'm putting in quotes. Um, mm-hmm. And so it really keeps us out of that. Absolutely. Yeah, good. I love that. I think that's important. Okay, so last question, unfortunately, because I want to keep talking. But so last question, um, if you were not doing what you're doing, what would you like to do instead? I, well, I actually do have plans. I want to create a community arts center in my neighborhood. I believe that creativity is essential for everybody. And so my dream is to have a community arts center for teenagers, for adults, for children, where art making art making can become a part of their daily lives. I love that. That sounds so fun. Um, okay. So tell everybody how to get in touch with you and um, where to find you. And I also understand you have a great free re- resource for people. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would love to ha- invite each of your listeners to my website. It's seek deeply.com seek like finding and I do have a resource for anyone who wants to do IFS on themselves it is an hour-long guide for solo IFS it takes you through the old steps it takes you through the three runways it gives you some pointers and there's also some nice music it's also can be used as a container because it's a set amount of time I've even used it myself pretending that the voice is someone else and it's worked very well. So they're welcome to come to my site and get that. That is very generous and very kind. So thank you for doing that. That's great. Um, Okay. So anything else, anything else you'd want to say? Yes, I, I am passionate about teaching people this and I do run a mastermind. So I'm run a nine month mastermind. It'll be enrolling in March. People, if they love this stuff, they can check out my site and join. And I would love to hear any burning questions that people have. They're welcome to email me. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It was really nice to talk to you. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. You know, there's parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you, thanks for listening.